tonight, or this afternoon, we have Miranda July. If you could all, if those of you who have a telephone, if you could turn those phones off, that would be much appreciated. Miranda will read for like 30 minutes or so, and then we'll take some questions from the audience and then sign books upstairs in the bookstore, which has sold out of her book. So if you don't already have a copy, we apologize. Miranda July is a true and transcendent Renaissance girl. Rare is the artistic human who can go from raw sound and performance pieces to filmmaking to fiction and to pull them off with such exemplary skill. Her music has even appeared on a soundtrack of one of the best snowboard movies ever produced. In other words, she, July, is synonymous with the perfection of freshly minted snowflakes. Miranda July wrote, directed, and starred in her first feature-length film, Me, You, and Everyone We Know, which won prizes at the Sundance Film Festival and at the, and the Camera d'Or at Cannes. <laughs> her fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Harper's, and the forthcoming Best American Non-Required Reading 2007, which is, of course, edited by Dave Eggers, who commented that fans of Laurie Moore should rub Miranda's debut story collection, No One Belongs Here More Than You, all over themselves. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but I think it's seriously good. Eggers continues, quote, there has been no more enjoyable and promising a debut collection in many a moon, unquote. July's harsh, Playful stories are full of stark, luminous surprises. She is a master of drawing readers into her charmed, troubling world of love, confusion, and peculiar joy at conveying the mysterious structure and logic of emotion. She does lovely, intuitive things with language within a single sentence and in the sequence of sentences that we've never really encountered before. Her withholding of information is just as scrumptious and intriguing as her elaborations. There are plays on words that turn on a dime and spin her characters and readers into one synthesized consciousness. Please welcome a writer who has us right where she wants us, Miranda July. kind of too early um, and had way too much time in the dressing room back there, which uh, at first I was just reading magazines and stuff, but there's a, a big mirror and after um, a long time I started like doing funny walks in front of the mirror and then I had so much time that I started thinking I should, when they announced me, I should come out like with a funny walk. <laughs> And I was totally convinced, you know, because I'd been in there like for years that that this was going to be great. And I was like practicing doing the funny walk, not looking at the mirror to be sure I could still do it. And and then right, just right then, a few seconds ago, when they opened the curtain, there was this voice like from God that was like, "Don't do the funny walk." <laughs> and I just, um, and then I'm glad. I'm really glad I had. The right instinct, I, I think. Let's just see how we do with the book before we get going with that. Um, so I'll I'll read now as if it's no big deal to read a book that one wrote and was published today. Um, <laughs> So, so a lot of these stories were written quite a while ago now because um, I started the book and then I made this movie and then I finished the book. Um, so, uh, you know, there's kind of Portland stories because I lived in Portland, Oregon for a long time and then there's LA ones and I'll, I'll start with a, a really old one, maybe the, the oldest one. It's 
how this person, someone is getting excited. Somebody somewhere is shaking with excitement because something tremendous is about to happen to this person. This person has dressed for the occasion. This person has hoped and dreamed, and now it is really happening, and this person can hardly believe it. But the time for believing, uh, but believing is not an issue here. The time for faith and fantasy is over. It is really, really happening. It involves stepping forward and bowing. Possibly there is some kneeling, such as when one is knighted. One is almost never knighted, but this person may kneel and receive a tap on each shoulder with a sword. Or more likely, this person will be in a car or a store or under a vinyl canopy when it happens, or online or on the phone. It could be an email, re your knighthood, or a long, <laughs> laughing, rambling phone message in which every person this person has ever known is talking on a speakerphone, and they're all saying, you've passed the test. It was all just a test. We were only kidding. Real life is so much better than that. <laughs> This person is laughing out loud with relief and playing the message back to get the address of the place where everyone this person has ever known is waiting to hug this person and bring her into the fold of life. It is really exciting and it's not just a dream, it's real. They are all waiting by a picnic table in a park this person has driven past many times before. There they are, it's everyone. There are balloons taped to the benches, and the, person, and the girl this person used to stand next to at the bus stop is waving a streamer. Everyone is smiling. For a moment, this person is almost creeped out by the scene, but it would be so like this person to become depressed on the happiest day ever. <laughs> and so this person bucks up and joins the crowd. <laughs> Teachers of subjects that this person wasn't even good at are kissing this person and renouncing the very subjects they taught. <laughs> Math teachers are saying that math was just a funny way of saying I love you. But now they're, they're simply saying it, I love you. And the chemistry teacher and PE teachers are also saying it, and this person can tell they really mean it. It's totally amazing. Certain jerks and idiots and assholes appear from time to time, and it's as if they have had plastic surgery. Their faces are disfigured with love. The handsome assholes are plain and kind, and the ugly jerks are sweet, and they're folding this person's sweater and putting it somewhere where it won't get dirty. <laughs> Best of all, every person this person has ever loved is there, even the ones that got away. They hold this person's hand and tell this person how hard it was to pretend to get mad and drive off and never come back. This person almost can't believe it. It seemed so real. This person's heart was broken and has healed, and now this person hardly knows what to think. This person is almost mad. But everyone soothes this person. Everyone explains that it was absolutely necessary to know how strong this person was. Oh, look, there's the doctor who pres prescribed the medicine that made this person temporarily blind. <laughs> and the man who paid this person $2,000 to have sex with him three times when this person was very broke. Both these men are in attendance and they seem to know each other. <laughs> they both have little medals that they are pinning on this person. They are badges of great honor and strength. The badges sparkle in the sunlight and everyone cheers. This person suddenly feels the need to check her post office box. It is an old habit and even if everything's going to be terrific from now on, this person still wants mail. This person says she'll be right back, and everyone this person has ever known says, fine, take your time. This person gets in her car and drives to the post office and opens the box, and there's nothing, even though it is Tuesday, which is a famously good day for mail. <laughs> this person is so disappointed. This person gets back in the car and, having completely forgotten about the picnic, drives home and checks the voicemail, and there are no new messages, just the old one about passing the test and life being better. There are no emails either, probably because everyone's at the picnic. <laughs> this person can't seem to go back to the picnic. This person realizes that staying home means blowing off everyone this person has ever known. <laughs> but the desire to stay in is very strong. This person wants to run a bath and then read in bed. In the bathtub, this person pushes the bubbles around and listens to the sound of millions of them popping at once. It almost makes one smooth sound instead of many tiny sounds. This person's breasts barely jut out of the water. This person pushes the bubbles onto the breasts and makes weird shapes with the foam. 
By now, everyone must have realized that this person is not coming back to the picnic. Everyone was wrong. This person is not who they thought this person was. This person plunges underwater and moves her hair around like a sea anemone. This person can stay underwater for an impressively long time, but only in a bathtub. This person wonders if there will ever be an Olympic contest for holding your breath under bath water. If there were such a contest, this person would surely win it. An Olympic medal might redeem this person in the eyes of everyone this person has ever known. But no such contest exists, so there will be no redeeming. This person mourns the fact that she has ruined her one chance to be loved by everyone. As this person climbs into bed, the weight of this tragedy seems to bear down upon this person's chest. And it is a comforting weight, almost human in heft. This person sighs, this person's eyes begin to close, this person sleeps. Has anyone read this? Yeah, this is all new. Yeah, okay, I mean, you totally advanced if you have, because uh, that's that's amazing. Okay, so for those of you who have, you can just don't give it away. Don't you know? Okay, you three, just keep it in. Okay, um, this one's longer, so settle back and get in a good position. Um, it's called the sister. Many times people have asked me if I would like to meet their sister. Some women never marry and don't fuss much with their appearance and the years don't tiptoe around them. These women, they have brothers and the brothers of such women often know a man like me, an old man who is alone. Men, often, men alone often have one or two large things wrong with them, but these are things that the brothers think their sisters should be able to live with. An example of such a problem is still being in love with one's deceased wife. This wasn't my problem. I'd never been in love with anyone, dead or alive. But this is an example of the type of problem that men like me have, sizable. We are often introduced to people's sisters. Sisters come in all ages. This took me a while to realize. I have no siblings, but I remember boys in school talking about their sisters, and so I always imagined sisters being of a certain age, school age. Did I want to meet their sister? At first I was taken aback to see such a tall, elderly sister, but of course everyone is old now, even the beautiful sisters of the boys I knew in school. It's been so long since I met a little girl. Men like me, men alone, we are the least likely people to be introduced to little girls. And I can tell you in one sentence why this is. Rape. <laughs> Almost all the purses in the world are made at one place, Deegan leather. Even if they have different tags on them, even if one of them says made in Sri Lanka and the other one says made in pride, made with pride in the USA, they were both assembled in Richmond, California at Deegan. When you finish your 20th consecutive year at Deegan, they throw you a party with hula punch and you automatically get free purses for the rest of your life. <laughs> Victor, Caesar, Sanchez, and I are the only two people who've gotten the party so far. We play a game called, what good thing can you make out of unlimited purses? <laughs> An example of a good thing is a leather house or a leather airplane that actually flies. <laughs> I didn't know the name of Victor's wife until she died last year. It was Caroline. I guess she wasn't Mexican like him. I'd pictured her Mexican all this time. And I did not know he had a sister until he asked, do you want to meet my sister? Her name was Blanca Cesar Sanchez. Again, I made the mistake of imagining her a teenager, a teenager in a white dress, new little breasts. I did want to meet her. He arranged for Blanca to meet me at an AIDS benefit party. Many of the people there were in their 20s and 30s, and I wondered if they were Blanca or the friends of Blanca. I went out of my way to be tolerant of them. There were also people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and these people had a chance of being Blanca too, or the 
parents of Blanca or grandparents or even great grandparents of Blanca if Blanca was a child. There were a few children running around, sisters of brothers who could be Blanca or Blanca's grandchild. The evening wore on. Many times I saw Victor and he told me he'd just seen a sister but lost her again. Then he said he had in fact sent her over to my table not 15 minutes ago to introduce herself and had I not met her, I had not. Well, what did you think of her? I didn't meet her. Oh, I thought you said you had. No, I said I, I had not. I had not. Well, that is a shame. I think she left. She told me she liked you. What? She said she wants to meet you again. But I never met her. Watch it. That's my sister you're talking about. <laughs> I am six foot three. I weigh 180 pounds. I have gray hair that is receded. I am not fit, but I have a naturally fast metabolism, so I am skinny, except for my stomach. Blanca came in and out of my life over the next few weeks, but she never came in far enough for me to see her. I failed to meet her in so many different ways that I began to know her anyway. I knew the qualities of her particular absence. I dressed up for it. I wore a suit that I'd never gotten the hang of in the 70s, but it felt all right now. It's an unusual suit because it's light beige, almost off-white. You don't see that color much in big amounts, suit and jacket, both. It became my uniform for not meeting Blanca. <laughs> was she at the tiny bubble lounge last night? She was. Did she introduce herself? No. I told, you sometime, I told her sometimes you go there. She's been stopping by regularly. I'd like to meet her. And she'd like to meet you. Victor, she's got to introduce herself. I see her in my dreams. And what does she look like? She's an angel. That's Blanca. That's the one. Is she, is she blonde? No, no, she's dark-haired like me. Oh, a brunette. Well, I don't know about that. You just said she was. Yeah, I just don't like to hear my sister talked about that way. <laughs> Brunette? That's nothing bad. Yeah, but it's how you said it. Brunette said by a man who has to use two hands to jerk off each night, that's what she did to me. I knew when she was near because I started breathing harder. The whole feeling in the room changed. Her smell wrapped itself around my face, and I just knew she was there, and I, I couldn't stop thinking she was a teenager even though it made no sense. The bar was full of smoke and men, but I could see her behind someone just out of view in tight jeans and tennis shoes, chewing gum with pierced ears and some kind of band holding her hair back, like a ribbon or some kind of plastic band and pierced ears. Okay, I said that already. Okay, that's what I saw. Some may say that such a girl is not ready for a relationship with a man, especially a man in his late 60s. But to that I say we don't know anything. We don't know how to cure a cold or what dogs are thinking. We do terrible things. We make wars. We kill people out of greed. So who are we to say how to love? I wouldn't force her. I wouldn't have to. She would want me. We would be in love. What do you know? You don't know anything. Call me when you've cured AIDS. Give me a ring then and I'll listen. I had never thought much about Victor, but now he became this exciting person because he was Blanca's brother. Victor thought of me differently too, more as a member of his family, as if Blanca and I were already a couple. He invited me over to a family-style dinner with Blanca and their parents. It was in an old people's home, and Mr. and Mrs. Cesar Sanchez were the oldest people I've ever met who are still alive. The food they ate was all intravenous. <laughs> when I asked Mrs. Cesar Sanchez where her daughter was, she looked so incredibly confused that I let it go. There was a picture of her on the wall, not Blanca, but her mother as a girl. She had Blanca's look in her eyes, come hither, come yon. Victor talked to his parents as if they understood him, but I knew they didn't. He gave them each a purse, the popular Soho-style shoulder tote in pebbled leather. It didn't seem like his parents would ever stand again, and, the sh and shoulder totes really demand standing, walking, living, needing, caring, toting. It seemed as if they were so far beyond these things, but I don't know. My parents died before I was old enough to give them anything. 
Victor and I ate the Chinese fried chicken that we had brought with us, and then we all watched a show where couples compete at remodeling their kitchens. Victor drove me home, and we did not speak in the car because what was there to say for the 18th, 100th, millionth, trillionth time she hadn't shown up? I had never been in love. I had been a peaceful man, but now I was caught in agitation. I accidentally hurt myself with my own body as if I were two clumsy people fighting. I held on to some things too tightly, ripping pages as I turned them and let go of other things too suddenly, plates, breaking them. Victor sat with me at lunch all week and tried to interest me in things that were not interesting. Finally, he invited me over to his apartment to have drinks with Blanca. I could tell this was it. I had wowed their parents with my comfortable silence. <laughs> Some people are uncomfortable with silences, not me. I've never cared much for call and response. Sometimes I will think of something to say, and then I will ask myself, is it worth it? <laughs> and it just isn't. I wore the same thing I'd worn all the other times. I thought I was going to meet her, the all beige. But this time I was more careful. I tucked my shirt into my boxers before I pulled up my pants, and when I pulled them up, they stroked the hairs on my legs. I was noticing everything. I was electric. Blanca, of course, was late. Victor and I laughed about this, and I really laughed because now it was really funny in a way that it had not been before. God damn that girl. She knew how to tease a guy. Victor and I toasted to Blanca and her lateness. I filled her cup and drank it for her. Here's to my girl, my little girl. At midnight, Victor cleared his throat and said there was something he hadn't told me. She's not coming? No, she's coming. Oh, good. But I had a little plan for tonight for you and Blanca. What? I have E. What? <laughs> I have E. What's E? <laughs> Ecstasy. Oh. Have you ever had it? No, I'll just stick with my beer. <laughs> You're gonna like this. Uh, I had a joint once, and I didn't feel right for a whole year. <laughs> it isn't like that. It'll make you nice and loose with Blanca. I don't think she wants me loose. Trust me, she does. She'll have the third tab when she comes in. Blanca likes this stuff? Of course. Is she like a wild, out-of-control teenager? You know she is. God, I thought maybe she was, but I didn't want to ask. Just put it under your tongue like this. Okay. Is she 17? Yeah. Now, let's just listen to the music and wait for it to kick in. <laughs> we sat on Victor's couch and listened to Johnny Cash or someone who sounds like that. A cowboy singer singing his cowboy song. I thought about Blanca and I could feel her coming closer. I could almost hear her shoes on the street below, the sound of her running up the stairs, the door flying open. I imagined this again and again, hoping the door would fly open at the exact moment that I was imagining it flying, flying open and it would be a dream come true. The music, the cowboy was part of this. It made the air thicker like I was thinking on the outside of my head. My thoughts were in the air, riding the song like a horse. I began to think of Victor as the cowboy. And for some reason, I said this. Even though I don't like call and response, I called out, Victor, yeah, it's like you're the cowboy. Yeah, what cowboy? Singing the song, the cowboy song. That's me, all right. You hear that sadness in my voice. I do. There's a lot of sadness in me. I can hear it. I think you've got a similar pain. I do. I want to see her so bad, Victor. You have no idea. I know. Can you just show me a picture, please? You know I can't do that. Why not? Come on to the couch. I sat beside Victor and I knew it was happening, the drugs. He held my hand and I rubbed his arm harder and harder and it felt okay. 
But then the rubbing was all of us, the whole length of our giant old selves. It was like a humping thing. I was thinking of eagles humping each other, and then I remembered, they don't hump, they lay eggs. I pushed him away. What if Blanca walked in? You're her brother. Let's just take our shirts off. The pants can stay on. Are you gay? I said the pants can stay on. <laughs> when do these drugs stop? If I drink water, do they stop sooner? Just let this happen. It's okay. Just let it happen. There's no Blanca. I didn't believe him for three hours. I, th I sat in Victor's bedroom and he stayed on the couch and we waited for the drugs to stop and I waited for Blanca. When the drugs were over, I suddenly knew he was right. It was as if I'd been on the drug for the last three months and now I was back. I came out of the bedroom and sat on the couch. I feel like she's been killed. I'm sorry. Do you even have a sister? No. Why did you take me to meet your parents? I wanted them to meet you before they died. Oh. It felt like the air was multiplying and I couldn't even think about what Victor said because I was so worried I wouldn't be able to keep up with the air. I tried to think of myself as a breathing machine. I told myself you won't die from over-breathing because you are a breathing machine, especially <laughs> calibrated to adjust to the changing amounts of air in the room. He said, tell me about the girls. What girls? You like little girls? No, teenagers. Where do you meet them? Well, I don't do that. I, I just think about it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Not even with Blanca? Yeah, I guess with Blanca, but sh that's different. You don't like grown women? Not so far, not yet. Have you ever had sex with a woman? Yeah. What about a man? No. Victor brought his arms around me and I felt sick in my stomach and my cock felt sick too. It felt feverish and painful and I rubbed it just to clear my head. Victor rubbed it too with tears on his cheeks and lips. I wanted to punch him, punch a hole right through him and then fill that hole with my body and I was, I was doing that. He was sobbing now the way Blanca would sob like a child. When I came, I came on the couch. I didn't want to come inside him because of what sperm can do. But he ate it off the couch and then he kissed me with a deep tongue so whatever sperm can do, it was doing to me. We slept. It was the sleep of 100 years. And when we woke, it was still night and Victor reached across me and turned on the lamp. We were two old men. Everything seemed ordinary even overly ordinary. There was a fly in the room and it buzzed around in a way that told us nothing amazing had ever happened in this place. I began to think about work, about the new hires and grommeting. I had to remember to tell them about the missing clamp on the heat sealer. I knew if I said something about this, if I said the word grommeting, then everything would be as it had been forever, amen. We'll have to talk to the new hires tomorrow. Yeah, didn't Albie train them on Wednesday? Yeah, but the ones in... I was about to say grommeting. The word grommeting was pulling up from the wet darkness under my throat. The G was coming forth with the grimace that makes the G sound. But in that instant, the buzzing fly lurched towards my ear and with an animal reaction, Fierce and unthinking, I swung at it and knocked over the lamp. It broke more than was fitting, crashing and shattering as if it were a lamp 12 times its size. In a final gesture, the, blobe expo the bulb exploded in fireworks that fell quietly, extinguishing themselves. We said nothing, but the sudden return of darkness seemed to be a question raised like eyebrows, waiting. Whatever I did next, whatever I said, would decide me. I didn't say grommeting. 
but the G stayed in my throat, gathering voice. I growled. And Victor turned to me right away, pressing his face against my neck. The new life came easily after this, a growl. seemed like probably one of the hardest stories to, to read in the book that's I think maybe the only one from the point of view of a man and I thought if I can do that at the first reading then I'm good for the next four weeks of my book tour. <laughs> so, um, uh, um, so how long has it been? Should I, what time is it? How long? <laughs> Keep going. What? Keep going. Well, I've learned better. It's like four people are saying that, but it's all the other people. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> um, I, I deal in numbers. Does anyone have the time? It's 7.45. Okay. If you want to read one more, feel free. It's 7.45, and I came on it. At seven ish. So it's actually been enough time. <laughs> it has been. I'm not trying to be quiet, it's just really hard to gauge, you know. Um, uh, I'm trying to see, that's actually like all I've. Uh, I could read, how about I'll, I'll read a few pages from a, a longer story, just a few pages, and then that'll inspire you to read the rest <laughs> on your own. Is that cheap? Um, let's see, 63. Um, I'll just read a little bit of this to make sure I'm not cheating people who came out from far away. And oh, for those of you who are sick of this, I know what that feels like. I just, readings are, it's so hard to be read to. Um, but maybe it's good for us, I don't know. Um, <laughs> All right, so just, I'll just read a, a little bit of this. Something that needs nothing. In an ideal world, we would have been orphans. We felt like orphans, and we felt deserving of the pity that orphans get. But embarrassingly enough, we had parents. I even had two. They would never let me go, so I didn't say goodbye. I packed a tiny bag and left a note. On the way to Pip's house, I cashed my graduation checks. Then I sat on her porch and pretended I was 12 or 15 or even 16. At all these ages, I had dreamed of today. I had even imagined sitting here waiting for Pip for the last time. She had the opposite problem. Her mom would let her go. Her mom had gigantic swollen legs that were a symptom of something much worse, and she was heavily medicated with marijuana at all times. We're going now, Mom. Where? To Portland? Can you do one thing for me first? Can you bring that magazine over here? We were anxious to begin our life as people who had no people. It was easy to find an apartment because we had no standards. We were just amazed that it was our door, our ratting carpet, our cockroach infestation. We decorated with paper streamers and Chinese lanterns and we shared the ancient bed that came with the studio. It was, this was tremendously thrilling for one of us. One of us had always been in love with the other. One of us lived in a perpetual state of longing. But we'd met when we were children and seemed destined to sleep like children or like an old couple who'd met before the sexual revolution and were too shy to learn the new way. We were excited about getting jobs. We hardly went anywhere without filling out an application. But once we were hired as furniture sanders, we could not believe this was really what people did all day. <laughs> Everything we had thought of as the world was actually the result of someone's job. Each line on the sidewalk, each saltine, everyone had a rotting carpet and a door to pay for. Aghast, we quit. There had to be a more dignified way to live. We needed time to consider ourselves, to come up with a theory about who we were and to set it to music. <laughs> with this goal in mind, Pip came up with a new plan. We went at it with determination. Three weeks in a row, we wrote and rewrote and resubmitted our ad to the local paper.
Finally, the Portland Weekly accepted it. It no longer sounded like blatant prostitution, and yet, to the right reader, it could have meant nothing else. We were targeting wealthy women who loved women. Did such a thing exist? We would also accept a woman of average means who had saved up her money. <laughs> the ad ran for a month and our voice mailbox overflowed with interest. Every day we parsed through the hundreds of men to find that one special lady who would pay our rent. She was slow to come. She perhaps did not even read this section of the Free Weekly. We became agitated. We knew this was the only way we could make money without compromising ourselves. Could we pay Mr. Hildebrand, the landlord, in food stamps? We could not. Was he interested in this old camera that Pip's grandmother had loaned her? He was not. He wanted to be paid in the traditional way. Pip grimly began to troll through messages for a gentle man. I watched her boyish face as she listened and realized that she was terrified. I thought of her small bottom that was so like a pastry and the warm world of complications between her legs. Let him be a withered man, I prayed, a man who really just wanted to see us jump around in our underwear. <laughs> Suddenly, Pip grinned and wrote down a name, Leanne. <laughs> that was a very gay selection. <laughs> that only hit me as I was reading. I was like, well, first the, yeah, okay. Uh, um, uh, so now is the questions. And we do have a couple mics that we'll be bringing around. People can raise their hands, just uh, give us a chance to bring the mic to you. So just raise your hand if you want to Oh. Batman. Do you first think about something that comes from inside of you to write, or do you mostly get images from outside and then start putting them together? Um, well, usually I, it's like I'll have maybe one little, like writing most of these stories, like one little thing that can kind of start me off that often is from the outside and I don't really know how it connects yet to the story, but it's interesting enough to me. Like, uh, what was this? Um, like the image, someone describing to me the image of their mom who had a like little crystal pennant that hung from the rear view mirror of the car and she was so used to her mom, every time she broke, braked on the car um, for her whole childhood, her mom would grab the pennant so it wouldn't hit the window. Um, okay, I haven't used that one yet. Um, but like, that's an example of something that combined with a, a feeling inside that's usually like an unresolved, um, like I don't actually know what the story's gonna be about and it's something in me that I don't know, those two things together kind of set me on my way. And, and so often the first paragraph ends up leaving and the crystal thing that you hold on, you know, that turns out to be totally irrelevant, but it, it's, it is a good um, starter. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um. Oh. Right. <laughs> that was. Um, um, I my question is, when you you began writing, you made a film and then your film and then you wrote more, but you also have a, another a huge body of work. And how do those when you go from project to project, how how do you find um, how do you find that they influence each other. Could you talk about that? Yeah, well, in all sorts of complicated ways, but the, I'll talk about what you mentioned. So I was writing really easily the first stories in this book. It was the first time I had written stories and I didn't know what I was doing and I thought it, writing was a joyful 
fun thing. <laughs> You know, that was sort of personal. You don't, you know, no one was going to see these. Then I made the movie. And then I came back to writing and it um, seemed next to impossible. It was as if I'd been like in a crippling car accident or something. And I had to learn how to walk again. Um, I, you know, I was just, I was self-conscious, which all of you probably know is not, it doesn't help um, the process. And, uh, and so I had that working against me, but what I had in my favor was I had, I had just worked incredibly hard on something harder than I ever thought I could. And I, I had kind of kicked a bunch of bad habits. Like I, I used to have, I felt, I feel like the habit of sort of not totally going that last 5% to make something really good. You're like, oh, I'm so close to the end. I can't even bear to go anymore. It's just, and I'll stop, you know, and I, I felt like I hadn't, I didn't do that with the movie and I sort of, you know, for whatever reason went on. And so I had all these kind of this diligence that I didn't have before. So I ended up writing stories that were much harder to write, but were much more ambitious. And I couldn't have even uh, desired, wanted to write if I hadn't made the movie. They were, they would take, they would be, have been too hard. Um, so it's a weird Thing. you know I feel like they they do influence each other and uh, you know you just try and focus on the good the good ways they they influence each other yeah okay <laughs> um, I read the first short story before I just bought the book today and it was seemed really autobiographical and I just assumed that it was but now hearing other stories they're not they're how much of it is autobiographical? Or um, the first story being that short one? The first person? one in your book. I read the oh. book. Oh, the first one in the book. What is that? <laughs> um, I'm not even... Oh, yeah, no, not at all. I mean, actually, there's only one that's even remotely autobiographical, which is that one I started to read only in as much as I moved to Portland as a young woman, so... Uh, you know, but I didn't move with my best friend, you know, it's totally fictionalized. Everything else, you know, other than things like grabbing the crystal, you know, there are little things obviously pulled from life, but they're not, they're my feelings, but they're not my stories. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, speaking of like little things, uh, there's a particular passage in the story, How to Tell Stories to Children, after the, um, I forget the dog, oh, lion? After lion. lion gets out of the pool and everything is flowing out of her and she's trying to describe the experience to um, the narrator, how did you... What type of research or what type of submersion did you like put your mind through to get into that child voice and capture it uh, so well? Um, you know, I mean, for me, writing and acting is super connected, and I don't. Sometimes I wonder, you know, how how would I do one if I couldn't do the other? And so for that, it's uh, you know, I'm just pretending to be that child, you know, so that's sort of talking too fast and I can picture the squeaky hard plastic water wings and the, you know, and it's all the, you know, I mean, it's just like, a, um, it's fun to be that child and then just try and type. Um, so that's, you know, and when I'm writing a s script, you know, then I'm literally, you know, I got to make sure everything's actable and, um, so yeah, it, it, it seems like those, I sort of, um, like even though I didn't write this book until, you know, start writing fiction until relatively recently, I, I realized that all the acting and all the writing dialogue for performance and stuff, that that, that was all that feeling and, and imagining was, was writing, yeah. Hi. So what are your plans now? Are you gonna continue with fiction or do another movie at all? Or right. Um, well, now, so I, I finished writing this actually like a year ago because it, it takes a while to, to get it, for it to come out. And then I, I wrote a performance um, and which was just sort of, 
uh, seemed a little sad and that I knew no one would see it or real, almost no one compared to the you know worldwide audience I had just worked so hard to make but that was where the ideas were coming from you know I was I felt free in that medium and um, so I, I wrote this performance which I did in in New York uh, last month or the month before and I I haven't done it here um, because I'm also writing a script that kind of came out of that performance as I was writing it. I, I, uh, I realized that, that there was more I wanted to do and, and that it, I kind of tricked myself into writing my next movie. So that's what I'm doing right now is, is uh, just writing drafts of that, trying to make it good enough. Yeah. So in all the different media that you've worked in, do you, I mean, you've worked both in, in areas where you're kind of inventing the medium as you go along, like performance and the website and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And then now you're working in more traditional mediums, like writing and making a feature film. Do you, does it feel any different, or do you think there's a distinction between those two modes of working, or is it all part of the same thing? Well, I mean, really, it's all the same thing, but I definitely the things that have you know, way, where I'm reading, you know, I'm reading so many other books by so many great writers and watching so many movies, I'm definitely, uh, it's, it's more work to be unselfconscious in those mediums, but like, uh, in, in a way it's like holding on to the, the amateur feeling, you know, I mean, for so long you kind of consider yourself an amateur and then, and now I, I try and like I made a website for this book and it was so fun because obviously I don't know how to make a website. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in a way that the joy of that sort of infected other things I was doing that did not seem as fun. Um, so it's like I'm always kind of playing games like that with myself to uh, make them all feel like something I just decided to do one day, you know. <laughs> um, I guess we're we'll, in, yeah. I'm sorry. Are we going to stop? Maybe I one more? I was just going to say we're just about to wrap it up. Okay. And please, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Miranda. And let's all meet in the bookstore for a book signing. Oh, OK, great. Thank you. Thank you.